Well, good morning. good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Everybody's still sufficiently full from the week, I hope. Yes? I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and we are so glad that you were here. Uh, doesn't the place look pretty this morning with all the Christmas decorations? So grateful to our folks that came out and helped with that. I want to uh, remind you of a couple of things that are coming up that are very important for us, and uh, I think it'll be um, important for you to, to be aware of this. One, next Sunday will be Jamie's annual Christmas concert. And uh, so you want to be here for that. It's a good time, great time to start off the season. So we really encourage you to come be a part of that. In conjunction with that, we are also having our December business meeting right following uh, the service. And so you want to be here for that. Uh, be a very important time for us as a church as we look to moving into the next year. And so we encourage you to be here and be a part of that next Sunday. Finally, I want to remind you that every year we help the uh, Crutcho schools by gathering Christmas gifts for the kids there, and 2020 is doing it again, and uh, so they've all gone virtual there at that school, and so we're having to do things a little bit differently. So back in the back, you'll see a table that has the envelopes and postcards, those kind of things like we normally have, and there's instructions on there about what to buy and how to get it to where it needs to go and all those kinds of things when you need to get it back up here all that and so if uh, if you have helped with that in the past and would like to help with that again i think there's about 37 of them back there not as many as we normally have uh, but we sure would like to help take care of those kids and those families so if you can help with that grab one of those and uh, just do what it says there and get those gifts back here i know they will very much appreciate that we are glad you're here. If you're a guest with us, we're glad you're here. If you are online watching, we're glad that you are able to be joining us this morning. I want us to pray together, and then we're going to jump right into our worship. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. We have, are coming off a, a great week of Thanksgiving, and Lord, despite all that is going on around us, we have an awful lot to be thankful for. Uh, God, you have given us so much. If we had nothing else but the gift of your son, we would have it all. And so we thank you for all that you have done and all that you have accomplished for us. God, bless this time right now as we move into worship. May it be about you, who you are, what you have done, and may everything we say and do bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. to stand with me this morning. of angels. Thank you. 
the first day of Advent, so I'm going to invite the Advent readers to come up and light the Advent candles. Well, good morning, church family. My name is Sandy Embry, and this is Sherry, my wife. Um, Thanksgiving has passed, and uh, we now enter the season of Advent. Advent just means coming or expectation, and no doubt it has been uh, a dark year, uh, the darkest uh, for many. Uh, uncertainty, fear, lack of personal contact, illness, death, dreams of glorious events dashed, racial unrest, political unrest, an ice storm and time literally in the dark, schools and upheaval. We could go on and on, but rarely do I get to say this, but there is no doubt that every person in this room and every person watching this has been impacted in 2020 by what is going on. <clears throat> and it's an ideal setting for light. If you didn't know it before, you certainly know it now, you need a savior. The world needs a savior. And today we begin celebrating the fact that one has come. Over the next several weeks, we will be introducing points of light in the form of candles and scripture. Our first passage today comes from Romans 8 verses 24 through 26 and it says for in this hope we were saved but hope that is seen is no hope at all who hopes for what they already have but if we hope for what we do not have we wait for it patiently in the same way the spirit uh, helps us what is this hope paul speaks of the answer is back in verses 18 and 19. Now, you have to keep in mind, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. He did not write it last night, okay? Bear that in mind as I read Romans 8, 18 and 19. And catch how he starts this. He says, for I am convinced, all right? Now, what are you convinced of these days? But Paul was convinced that the sufferings of this present age cannot be compared with the glory which is destined to be disclosed to us. The created world waits with eager expectation the day when those who are the sons of God will be displayed in all their glory. Our hope is in the fact that we are the children of God. We have been adopted into the family of God and we are his children. For Paul, life was not a weary, defeated waiting. It was a throbbing, vivid expectation. As Christians, we are involved in the human situation. Within, we must battle with our own human nature. Without, we must live in a world of de disease, death, and decay. Nonetheless, we live not only in the world, we live also in Christ. We see not only the world, we look beyond it to God. We see not only the consequences of our sin, but we see the power of God's mercy and love. Therefore, the keynote of our life is always hope and never despair. We wait not for death, but for life. <clears throat> in 
It reminds me of a hymn written in 1834 by Edwin Moat, the title of which he originally called The Immutable Basis for a Sinner's Hope. Immutable means unchanging, the unchanging basis for a sinner's hope. That's not how we know the hymn today. I'm going to quote the first couple of lines, and you will recognize it immediately. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. The story of our hope begins with Luke 1, 29 through 33. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Today, we light the candle of hope. Stand with me again as we continue to worship Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. In righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, the cornerstone, we can make strong. The Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. darkness seems, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within. shall come, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, 
Dressed in his righteousness alone Fall and stand before the throne Let's sing Christ alone Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love And through the storm He is Lord Lord of all One more time, Christ alone Jesus Christ, my sinner, sweet Jesus Christ, my clearer, bread of heaven, broken, cup of salvation, held out to Jesus. History. And Christ has died, and Christ is risen, Christ will come again. As Christ has died, and Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Sing, sweet Jesus Christ. Sweet Jesus Christ, my sinner. Sweet Jesus Christ, my clearer. And bread of heaven broken for me. Come, salvation. Held up to dream Jesus mystery and Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again and Christ has died and Celebrate his death and rising. Celebrate his death and rising. Lift your eyes, proclaim his coming. Celebrate his death and rising. Lift your eyes, lift your eyes. Celebrate his death and rising. Lift your eyes, proclaim his coming. Celebrate his death and rising. Lift your eyes. Christ has died, and Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And Christ has died, and Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. 
Christ is risen, and Christ will come Sing that chorus one more time this morning. Christ has died. And Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song and you are good the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my face the echo of my days oh he is my song and you are God is holding on to me. God is holding on to me. 
Acknowledge what you're doing, even amidst the turmoil and the hardship, God. Holy Spirit, would you continue to make yourself known? Jesus Christ, we thank you for your gift, Father God. We need you. As we enter into this season of Emmanuel, God with us, we acknowledge once again that you are good, God. You are good. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Be seated. It's good to be with you this morning. We are in the 11th and final week of our fall series called Warning Signs, and we're in the third and final week of our emphasis on stewardship. Can you believe it? It's all going to finally end. Amen. After all these weeks, all the questions, when will it ever end? You finally know the answer. It's today, all right? Next week, we get to enjoy the uh, annual Jamie Smith Christmas concert, and then before you know it, it will be Christmas, and we'll be celebrating together, hopefully, on Christmas Eve. But first, we need to finish up our series that we've invested so much in over these past several months. We're going to finish that up today. A couple of weeks ago, we began sort of the stewardship part, the stewardship emphasis, by talking about the power and the pull that stuff has over us and why it's so important that we employ generosity in order to break the power of greed in our lives and that we make sure that we're putting God's kingdom first and our kingdom second with this approach to our finances. Give, save, live. And then last week, we focused on some very specific warning signs that would help us to keep our commitment to be good stewards of all that God has blessed us with and would allow us to enjoy the experience of being generous towards God and towards others. This morning, we're going to finish up with a parable that I hope will help us kind of take a, a few steps back and look at stewardship from a much wider angle. I want us to talk about stewardship today, not just from the perspective of our money or our stuff, but from the perspective of our entire life, everything that we have, everything that we do. And I want to show you how our role as a steward changes, think about this, once our life comes to an end, and how that ought to impact the way that we actually live our lives right here, right now, on earth. The parable that we're going to look at is the story of the rich man and poor man Lazarus found in Luke 16, 19 through 31. If you have your Bible with you, if you have your Bible app ready to go, we're going to be in Luke 16. We'll have all the scripture behind me here on the screen as well. But we're going to be talking about this story of the rich man and the poor man Lazarus. Now, during a, a kid's sermon one time, I told the story of the rich man and poor man Lazarus. And I explained that while the wealthy man had wonderful clothes, that Lazarus had tattered rags, that the rich man lived in luxury, he had all of the food he could eat, but he had no compassion for Lazarus, who longed for just a few crumbs from the rich man's table. I explained that the heartless man died, and, and the Bible says he ended up in hell. Lazarus, however, found God's comfort in paradise. And after finishing the story, I asked the children a question that was going to help kind of lead me into, you know, the moral of the story. And the question I asked was, now, which would you rather be? Would you rather be the rich man or the poor man, Lazarus? And one little boy, there's always one, who is just as confident as he could be that he knew the exact right answer explained to me without a doubt in his mind, I'd want to be the rich man while I was living and Lazarus when I died. <laughs> yeah. You know, never underestimate the intelligence of a child or the honesty for that matter. 
Because that is uncomfortably close to the way a lot of people would like to think that they can live. With one set of values and priorities in life, and then a completely different set of values and priorities in eternity. And unfortunately, the reality is, hear me now, that is not an option. Now, as we read this story, it's easy to come to the conclusion that what Jesus is trying to to say here is that being rich, you know, however you define that, is bad. And that rich people probably aren't going to heaven. In fact, that's the way a lot of people interpreted this story over a lot of of years, but as we dig beneath the surface a little bit, I'm going to show you that the point Jesus was trying to make was not about the issue of wealth, but incredibly, it was about the issue of life stewardship and how our relationship with our stuff, the things that we own, the money that we have, things that we can hold in our hand, our relationship with our stuff often gives us insight into our relationship with our heavenly Father. We begin in Luke 16, verse 19, it says this. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen. Now, those were the colors of kings, just so you know. And who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. So right off the bat, we learned that this rich man lived in luxury, which in and of itself doesn't seem like too big of a deal since there are a lot of people who live in luxury every single day. But it turns out it wasn't just that he lived in luxury. Apparently, it was the kind of luxury he lived in That was an issue. Verse 19 in the Greek actually ends with the word brilliantly. And this particular form of the word brilliantly means something that glares so brightly in your eyes that you can't physically bear to look at it. In other words, it shines so bright, it's actually repulsive. Are you with me? What Jesus was saying was, Not just that this man was wealthy, but that he was flamboyant, that he was excessive, that he was outrageous in his wealth. Verse 19 also uses a word which means to live in celebration, in celebration. Now, Jesus used the exact same word in the parable of the prodigal son when the father celebrated the return of a son that he thought he'd lost forever. So in celebration, there is an appropriate lifestyle of celebration. But for this rich man, the implication is that the thing he used his wealth to celebrate every day was himself. Now, you might read this story and say, well, it was his wealth, right? I mean, he earned it, or at the very least, he inherited it. He ought to be able to use it any way that he wanted to. But that's where we come to the issue of life stewardship. Because when you live your life viewing yourself as an owner and celebrating yourself as the center of the universe instead of God, there is a tendency to be blinded to the needs of anybody else but yourself. Does that make sense? And it's really important that we get that. You see, the the outside this rich man's gate was a person in terrible, terrible need. A man named Lazarus, who was apparently very, very sick. Apparently, he was so sick that someone, we don't know who Jesus doesn't fill in these blanks for us, but apparently, think about it, someone laid him at the rich man's gate each and every day, right? In hopes that this man who had so much might be willing to share a little. Jesus makes a comparison between the way 
the two men lived. He says that while the rich man lived in complete luxury and celebration of himself, wearing, again, purple and fine linens, Lazarus's body was starved and covered in sores. He was so hungry that he longed for anything that just fell off the table of the rich man. Imagine being that hungry. And to add insult to injury, the local dogs would even come and lick his sores, a reminder that he was the lowest of the low. Every day in his celebration, the rich man would, would look out of his luxury to see the poor man and if he was still there, hoping that Lazarus would just leave him alone, but he wouldn't give him any food. Because, you know, if you start that, they'll never leave. I guess charity just couldn't have been any less convenient for the rich man. And so day after day, the rich man turned Lazarus away. Now, here's something I need you to know. In the, in the Israelite culture, from the very beginning, from the giving of the law, it was made very clear, we will not have Poor, poor people in desperate need. We will not. Because I, your God, will bless you so much that there will be enough for everybody. And you will help to take care of those who are in desperate need. And so they knew that from the very beginning. But apparently somewhere along the way, they had forgotten. In truth... If you think about it, Lazarus' daily turnout should have been a blessing and not a burden to this rich man. Because every day this, this poor man shows up on his doorstep was another day that God gave the rich man the opportunity for his hardened heart to be softened towards God. What the rich man should have been learning is the first of our life stewardship principles. And that is this, that once life is over, our opportunity as a steward ends. Now, you'll see what I mean in just a minute, but for now, the application of that principle is this, as a steward of your stuff, be generous now. Be generous now. See, the wise man shares his resources generously as a way to honor his heavenly father, while the foolish man hoards what doesn't even belong to him in the first place. Unfortunately for the rich man, he was about to learn that instead of the issue being a matter of financial profit or loss, it was about to become an issue of eternal life or eternal death. We pick up the story again in verse 22. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and his his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. If you've ever heard the phrase, Abraham's bosom, this is where it comes from. This is the idea. The Jews traditionally believed that the first person they would meet when they got to heaven, the person who would be there to comfort them, would be Abraham, Father Abraham, the original patriarch of Israel. Verse 24. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. You know, I think it's interesting that People spend so much time preparing for life on earth, but so little time preparing for life after earth. We're not told explicitly why the rich man was in hell, but we do have a a glimpse of why the poor man was actually in heaven. 
Remember that this is a parable, a story that Jesus is telling specifically to make a point. And that means that he gets to choose the details to fit his point. Does that make sense? So he's telling this story. He knows where he's starting and he knows where he wants to end. And he's filling in the details to make the story come out where he wants it to. Well, the name that he gives to this poor man is Lazarus. And that name was significant because Jesus actually had a friend named Lazarus, do you remember, who lived in, a, in nearby Bethany. But in this case, it's the meaning of the name he chose that is the most significant. You see, the name Lazarus or Eleazar literally means God is my helper. So what do you think the point was that Jesus was trying to make? By giving this poor man the name Lazarus, Jesus was identifying him in the story as a man whose trust was in God. And a point seemed to be that those who seek and those who find and those who accept God, no matter how little, no matter how much they have in this life, those are the ones who end up with God in eternity. It seems clear that the rich man, on the other hand, never responded to the God who gave him life. And i got to point something out. If, if you've got your Bible open and, and you look back to what he said, let me find it here real quickly. When Abraham responds in verse 25, Abraham said to him, said to the rich man, son. Did you catch that? He called him son with a capital S, by the way. Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted. You know what that's a reference to? It's a reference to the fact that, that the rich man was a child of Abraham. That he, in his mind, in his heart, he belonged to God. He belonged to Abraham. And therefore, of course, he was going to go to heaven. Of course. He, he's like one of you guys who were born in a church nursery. You were born with a, if you're Baptist, you were born with like a, a fried chicken drumstick sticking out of your mouth, right? Right? He was in. He knew he belonged there. And Jesus, by telling this story very carefully, is showing us that's not what it takes. you got to have your trust in me. You see, this rich man, he never responded to God. This God who had so richly blessed him. And it never occurred to him that he was only a steward of his stuff and that he could have been sharing it with others all along as a way to honor the God who had provided all of it to him in the first place. So, while there's no evidence to suggest that his wealth is what kept him out of heaven, there is plenty of evidence that his relationship, listen to me, with money and with wealth and with stuff was a reflection of his lack of a relationship with God. Now, does that make sense? It needs to for each and every one of us. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your, what's the word? Your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's why stewardship, by the way, I love, one of my favorite things as a pastor is when I ask you to say a word in Scripture, and you're like, heart. I mean, do you guys practice that? Do you guys have some practice behind the scenes I don't know about? I, I would think, I'm going to give you a chance to say a word from Scripture. You're going to be like, heart. And instead, it's like, Ugh, like my, it's like telling your teenager to take out the trash or something. Maybe we should try it again. Where your treasure is, there your will be also. See how much better that sounds? That feels good. Even the people at home feel good right now, okay? And, that's, and, and again, that is why stewardship is, is such an important component of our relationship with God. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also being selfish or generous with our stuff, listen, that will not get us in or keep us out of heaven. But it definitely reflects where our loyalty and our priorities are. And so while Lazarus was enjoying the reward of his faithfulness in heaven for the rich man, things were not turning out quite so well. Because apparently hell is not a cool place. In the Bible... 
It is pictured as a place of intense suffering and of unceasing sorrow. Suffering hints at the physical torment and sorrow at the emotional torment. Maybe the worst part of how hell is described here is the eternal separation of the godly from the ungodly. It's described as a great chasm, not just a a gap, but a gulf, not a crack, but a canyon. And the, the chasm wasn't a physical distance because the rich man could still see Lazarus, but apparently it was an eternal separation, a place where no one can escape, where no one can cross over from one side to the other. Mark Twain, who was pretty smart and pretty funny, once joked, I'll take heaven for the climate and hell for the society. Except that's not how it works. See, hell will not be a place where all our rowdy friends and famous sinners gather for an eternal party. Hell is about total isolation and separation from God. Now, interestingly, in all of this torment, the rich man's focus turns towards his favorite person. Anybody want to guess who that is? Himself. (laughs) Unbelievably, incredibly, the first thing he does is ask Abraham if he will send Lazarus over to ease his pain. Think about that. To serve him. And to comfort him. Let me ask you, how many times did did the rich man serve Lazarus in his life? How many times did he comfort Lazarus in his life? Zero. And yet, the first opportunity he has, it calls on Lazarus to come and to take care of his needs. It's unbelievable. There's also a little nugget of insight here that you don't want to miss. I wonder if you noticed it when we read it earlier, the rich man actually knew Lazarus by name. Did you catch that? He knew his name. Apparently, Lazarus wasn't just some poor, needy, sick person who was invisible to this rich man in all of his wealth. Lazarus, it turns out, was someone the rich man knew and chose to ignore. And it's pretty clear that he still considers himself to be superior to the lowly Lazarus, doesn't he? Almost as if this whole heaven-hell arrangement must be some kind of big mistake. Get me out of here. You've got me in the wrong place. And so we ask Abraham to send Lazarus over to help, help him out, only to find out about our second life stewardship principle. Once life is over, Our opportunity for salvation ends. Abraham explains the situation that the torment is permanent and that it's deserved and that there was nothing that could be done about it even if they wanted to, which brings us to our second application. As a steward of your eternity, you must seek God now, right now. You see, many of us spend our entire lives trying to separate ourselves from God, trying to keep God at an arm's distance so we don't have to feel guilty about our actions, so that we don't have to feel judged whenever we mess up. We spend our whole lives trying to live apart from God only to find out when we die that we may get exactly what we always wished for. Now, there's a tendency for us to think that that's not fair, right? That a loving God surely wouldn't send somebody to hell. But you need to understand this. If that's a question you've ever asked, it's a totally legitimate question. It's a question lots and lots and lots and lots of people have asked. But here's what you need to understand. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We send ourselves there. You know why? Because we are stewards of our own eternity. Think about that. God sent 
his only son to die on the cross for our sins. Why? So that no one would ever have to go to hell. So if a person ends up in hell at the end of their life on earth, it's not because God sent them there, but because that person rejected all of God's efforts to keep them away from hell. We are stewards of our own eternity. And that is why we must seek God right now. We go on, verse 27. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, no, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent from, to them from the dead... Then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And I don't know about you, but that is one of the most gut-punching verses in all of Scripture to me. I want you to notice that the instant that the rich man realized that his opportunity as a steward of his stuff and his opportunity, a steward of his own eternity, the moment all of that ended, he immediately turned his attention, where? To his lost family. And I'll be honest with you, I actually think he makes a really good argument for sending Lazarus back to earth to tell the rich man's brothers about what would happen to them apart from a relationship with God. But Abraham says no. He says they know all about it. They've got the prophets. They've got the law to remind them of this. But then the rich man says something that ought to just blow you out of your seat. He says, no, Father Abraham, I know my brothers. I know that religion by itself isn't enough. that don't miss that what have I always told you about stewardship it's not about money it's not about some religious responsibility it's part of your relationship with God for where your treasure is there will your heart be also do you realize that the people in your life that you love are watching you They're being influenced by you for good or for bad. And if all they ever see is that you know how to hold on so tightly to stuff or that you're really good at doing religion, listen to me, it's not nearly enough. The rich man says, I know my brothers. They're just like me. Religion will not be enough to pierce their hearts. And then, this rich man actually comes up with the greatest salvation plan in the history of the world. You ready? He says, but what if a man came back from the dead? No, no, come on, come on, come on. They didn't know he was coming back from the dead yet, right? They didn't know nothing about Lazarus over in Bethany yet. This was not a concept. This was not something that they discussed, you know, over lunch. And he says, it's like the light bulb goes on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Religion's not going to do it. Just reading the law is not going to do it. But wait a minute, what if a man actually came back from the dead to tell them about their choice between heaven and hell? And then Jesus, the same Jesus who would later in the book of Luke raise a friend named, go ahead, Lazarus, yes, thank you, Lazarus from the dead, right? The same Jesus who would eventually die on a cross for our sins, and then three days later, he himself would raise from the dead. This same Jesus concludes the story by saying that even if a man were to come back from the dead, 
some people would still not believe. Why? Because their hearts were so hardened. Because their priorities were so messed up. Because they had purposefully or unknowingly created so much space between them and and God. And that's a hard one for me because when I was a kid, that's what I wanted from God. I just wanted God to leave me alone. Just get as far back from me as you possibly can, and I will be just fine. Because they saw themselves as owners of their own life and eternity. And it all started with seeing themselves as owners, not stewards of their stuff. And that brings us to our final life stewardship principle. Once our life is over, our opportunity to reach others for Christ ends. Therefore, as stewards of the gospel, we must share Christ now. Do you see that the principle of stewardship applies to the gospel just like it does to our stuff? We do not own the gospel, but it has been entrusted to us to share with others. And do you see that if we can become good stewards of our stuff, and a good steward of our own eternity, how much more effective will we be as stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Understand this, our stuff and the way that we view it, the way we deal with it, treat it, and handle it is really just practice for much, much more important eternal things. And that is why I want so badly for you, for me, for us to get this right. Let's finish up all these weeks. Have I ever preached an 11-week series? I don't know. I may do it in 20-week next time. Does that sound good to everyone? Let's finish up our series with this question, okay? What commitment do you need to make what steps do you need to take to move in the direction of your heavenly father this year in the area of stewardship? Now, maybe you're not even a Christian yet, but you're seeking after God. You're investigating. You're considering. You're trying to understand. Listen to me. Keep going. You're on the right track. Keep going. Your first step is to recognize you are not an owner, but a steward of of your own eternity. Choose today not to resist God and all that he has done for you to secure your eternity with him, but instead accept the gift of salvation that Jesus died to provide. That's what, that's what Christmas is about, is it not? This incredible gift given to us. Maybe Today, you're a person who's been a Christian for a little while or a long time, but you never really got started on obedience in the area of stewardship. Or maybe you've struggled to remain obedient. I'm challenging you not to walk out of here today until you've determined how to take at least one step towards obedience to God as a steward of everything that he has entrusted to you. Or maybe you're a Christian who settled the issue of stewardship a long time ago in your life. You've got the right perspective. You've got the right process in place. But God is showing you, I want to grow you in this area. Or I want, I want you to try something new in this area. Ask God. He'll show you what it is. And remember, when it comes to God, when it comes to your relationship with him, everyone is in a different place on the journey. Every single one of us. It does not matter where you are, only that you take steps in his direction. Will you pray with me? Father, we need to get this right. Because as we see, this idea of stewardship, it's not just about our stuff. That's hard enough. 
that's serious enough. That's big enough. But God, it's not enough. Because really, stewardship is about our eternity. So we got to get it right. We got to make sure your kingdom is first. We got to make sure that you are the Lord of our life. We got to make sure that you are in charge, that you are the priority in our life. And it turns out that our stuff, the stewardship of our stuff, is just practice for a much, much, much bigger issue the issue of our eternity with you. So, God, right here this morning, I pray. I pray for each one of us, no matter where we are in relationship to you, I pray that we would sincerely seek you. And as we seek you, that we would find out what obedience to you looks like and that we would take at least one step in your direction, God. One step towards you truly being everything for us. The air that we breathe, everything. God, help us move in your direction today. We love you. And we want to be obedient to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray to you. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? Let's take these last few minutes and let's just seek God, ask him to show us how to be obedient no matter where we are on a path towards him. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. I'm seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. to that. Guys, if you just bow your head with me as we lift praise up to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the words from Justin, uh, Lord, that you blessed him with. I just pray for our church today as we uh, seek earnestly after you, we chase after you, that we understand the importance and the blessing that the gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. And we understand the importance of not just seeking you, Lord, but then sharing you. Sharing the good news. Lord, let us be a church. Let us be a people that speak boldly for you. Lord, 
give us opportunities throughout today, throughout the weeks, throughout the months, throughout this next year to be good stewards of our faith, to be good stewards, like Justin said, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we go out, give us eyes and ears to see opportunities to serve you. In your Lord's name.